Okay, we're going to continue. Um, there are now five presentations. Uh, the first of the presentations is by Alvaro Jimenez, Felix Ortega and colleagues. And unfortunately they cannot come. And Felix and Alvaro asked me, uh, asked the organizers to, um, for the possibility to send a video presented here and the Central Committee accepted this request, and so we're going to, to begin with this video. And if you have any questions or comments, please email them. I will provide their email if you need it. Okay, the presentation is entitled Generation Z versus Adults in the Ecuadorian Digital Integration from 2015 to 2019. Thank you correctly. Hello everyone and welcome to this conference. Next, we are going to start with the presentation of the research entitled Generation Zeta versus Adults in the Ecuadorian Digital Integration from 2015 to 2019. Made by Alvaro Jiménez Sánchez of the Technical University of Ambato, by Félix Ortega Moedano of the University of Salamanca, Elisa Vallas Ruiz and Carlos Martinez Bonilla, also from the Technical University of Armato, and finally by Jose Maria Lavín from the Centro Universitario de Cine, Santander. My name is Maria Rosa Frontera and I will collaborate with the team making this presentation during the next few minutes. First of all, we apologize for not being able to do with you in person. It was not our purpose at all, and sadly, no one had been able to attend this magnificent event. In any case, let's start with the presentation talking about the progressive increase of the telecommunications sector worldwide in recent years, and especially in the Andean country. Ecuador is one of the countries with the greatest advances in telecommunication, with the relevance when it comes to offering better services. The proposal of Andres et al. argues that with higher economic growth, no internet access for low middle income countries and easily verifiable point in the case of Ecuador. According to the latest official data, more than 74% of Ecuadorians connect to the internet at least once a day. With few differences between sex, 40% use it to obtain information, 31% to communicate in general, 21% for educational issues and 3% for work reasons. During the same time period landline, telephony decreased from 42.4% to 36.9%. At the same time, the use of a smartphone, people with 5 years and older who have activated a smartphone, increased in 2012 from 12.2% .2 to 63.6% .6 with the age group of 16 to 24 years or more they possessed 82.8% and without any differences between sexes. The objective would be that all habitants learn and use the possibilities offered by the digital age under the promise of a hyper-connectivity, both spatially and temporally, that is high-quality connection at any place at any time. The evolution to arrive to this point is worthy of being studied and followed longitudinally as part of technological progress. Since this research focuses more on the so-called generation Zeta, it is necessary to clarify some concepts. Millennials and the later generation, called Generation Zeta, are currently at the avant-garde of a digital revolution characterized by the heterogeneous use of the internet. Regarding this denomination, other authors prefer to talk about Generation Y and Zeta, making a distinction between the year of birth or in terms of a digital integration or assimilation. The lack of definition to cataloging and separating the cohorts is very large. Furthermore, we cannot think that both groups are uniform within themselves. To a 
Although this problem would have been preferred to get the idea of Kronsky of differentiating digital natives from digital immigrants, although with some hint, since also the cohort proposal of Kronsky is debatable. It can be understood that digital natives are grown in an environment where digital is present on a regular way, while digital immigrants have to get familiarity with electronic resources in their youth and or maturity. So, for the purpose of this research, we have proposed that Ecuadorian digital natives are those born when mobile telephony was introduced in Ecuador in 1993. At the time, Conecel S.A. Porta enters into the Ecuadorian market which will place digital natives with an age equal to or less than 25 years and digital immigrants with more than 25 years of age. This age difference in internet consumption and its services may become even more important in certain aspects that differences by nationality. Faced with a demand that does not stop growing, it is the millennials, but especially the generation Zeta, who are the most involved with the new technologies. They are who establish themselves as the new consumers in a growing economy in the world and especially in Latin America. In short, the data about it so the need to put the focus here to detect the changes that are coming from the media in the Andean country. But to be able to speak of the predominance in the young people, we must think that there also exist other age ranges less assiduous to internet. Therefore, the approach of this research is to know the possible digital division in age and in addition to investigate the differences between genders and finally to analyze how new technologies are evolving and the uses that citizens uh, make of them. Let's go on to detail the methodology. A survey was prepared based on similar research on the possession and use of different technological devices, especially the one provided by Ortega, Gonzalez, Ampere, and Inec. The final questionnaire contained more than 35 items with mostly structured answers. It was provided online to the university community in Central Ecuador, Technical University of Ambato. And this in turn shared with other people outside the academic field through social networks. In total, there were 537 participants, of which 24% did so at the end of 2015 and during 2016. The second wave was in 2017, 37%, and the third time was in the middle of 2019, 39%. Grouping the age ranges resulted in approximately 65% young people under the age of 25 and 35% adults of 25 or older. Regarding the gender proportion, 57% were female and the rest male. The data were analyzed with the SPSS software version 23 using descriptive and information analysis according to the typology of the variables, T-square and experiment correlation. Finally, the statistically significant results, P less than 0.05, related to the variables age, young and adult, gender and year, 2015, 2017 and 2019, were summarized. Regarding the results obtained, there is a significant increase, P less than 0.05, in the number of smartphones both at home, for example, from 33% who claim to have two in 2015-2016 to 48% in 2019, and at the minimum level, where 84% now have their own smartphone. In 2017, the Samsung brand reached 66% of people, but now remains the same as at the beginning approximately 50%. Apple in 2017 fell to 8.5% and today stands at 13.8%. These changes are caused largely by the increase of Huawei, which in recent years has gone from 6% to 21% of people 
of course, cell phones are of this oriental brand, which means all this the domain of Android, 80% versus iOS. The average spending per cell phones has been decreasing, where the majority is around the range of $100 to $350. The number of desktops or laptops in the home is similar, going from 26% of people who had one in 2015-2016 to double today, and where 30% have two of these devices in the home. The opposite happens with the tablet, whose possession in homes has been reduced to 42 percent, which no longer has any compared to the initial 61 percent. There are significant differences with the number of televisions, it goes to 72 percent that have at least two, and with the smart TVs, as it goes from 8 percent at the beginning to 20 percent of people that have at least two. It also exists the decrease in the hiring of services from the state-owned company National Telecommunication Corporation. CMT to 24% and the increase of Netflix to 18. Cable TV has a decrease up to 20% while direct TV corresponds to 10%. There is an increase in the number of people who watch television through intelligent cell phones from 40% to 78%. And much more if it's audio visual content in general when it increases to 93% that they do it through the cell phones. And drop it to 81% of those surveyed who do it through the PC, remaining stable in video consoles, 21%. Although traditional television is still the most watched medium, its use has been reduced and hours have increased on cell phones, computers, and a smart TV to watch TV content, with a daily average of approximately 2 hours, and increasing its use on weekends on a smart TV and cell phones. It has reduced the use of the room and has significantly increased television consumption in the bedroom through cell phones, 71%, computers 45%, while the room will be allocated more by the tablet and the smart TV to watch TV programs. What most attracts their attention to consume television has also varied over time depending on the device. They currently run their preference in the cell phone for mobility, comfort and high resolution. Opt for the PC because of its larger screen and high resolution. <coughs> Traditional television, thanks to its larger screen, comfort and high resolution. And finally, a smart TV for its high resolution and larger screen. An increase from 72% to 88% has been observed in the number of people who watch these contents through streaming media platforms, with Netflix being the most used and the ones that have increased the most in recent years, unlike YouTube. What strikes the most about these streaming media platforms is about all to see what you want when you want but also the high quality, the wide catalog to see series and of films, premieres, and the live channel service. With respect to the significant differences by age, less than or greater than 25, the older ones are characterized by having more smartphones, computers, tablets, and individually more smart TV and pay TV. Possible the life from purchase and power, adults have more services contracted at home and spend more on average in consuming audiovisual content. While young people see more audiovisual content through the smartphone, especially with free apps, and less with the tablet, where adults have more apps downloaded with respect to this device. Young people use traditional television to a greater extent. WhatsApp, the computer, the cell phone with more applications installed, and less smart TV. The most common place to use these technologies is in the bedroom, as compared to adult, except with the smart TV where young people use it more in the living room and older people in the bedroom. At the same time, what most attracts the attention of the digital natives with respect to the cell phone is their comfort, while adults value mobility more. The same as for the tablet and the computer, but this time also prefer them for comfort, while young people for the big screen. The main difference between contents is that adults prefer news and music more, while minors prefer movies and series more, especially on streaming video platforms, 86% compared to 
85% of adults. Thus, those over 25 have a CNT or direct TV know why nine hours watch more Netflix and YouTube. With respect to a few significant differences between genders found, men have more than consoles, pay TV, computers, watch more internet TV, or more applications downloaded to consume audiovisual content, and not more for content such as sports and news, while women are more inclined towards YouTube music and videos. In short, the results show some variations in the use and possession of some technologies analyzed with respect to gender and age while observing how this has changed during the period of family investigation. Well, now we are going to finish with the following conclusions. The data obtained confirms some numbers mentioned at the beginning by the INEC. There are more contracted devices and services as well as their use depending on factors such as age or gender. At the same time, that audience is even towards a convergent program at casting model in service platforms such as Netflix. The traditional television model is progressively abandoned, finding a hybrid consumption that combines elements of both scenarios. Likewise, the battle between Samsung and Apple seems to continue with greater benefit for the brand with the Apple operating system, a fact possibly increased by a lower cost, especially in times of economic crisis. In any case, the trend is toward monopoly for both companies, as is the case with the telecommunications company, and where the hardware brand has increased significantly in the years analyzed. The positive attitude of the users of the streaming services is modifying the advertising model towards a more direct and personified one. The advertising agencies and propaganda institutions must continually investigate the different audiences if they want to renew themselves in this continuous changing sector. That is, on demand products carry advertising on demand, how more specific is the consumer working with the strategy of marketing to get to it? It also confirms the number of the lack of dual leadership in a smartphone. However, every time there is less generation dividing its use. Adults are also taking advantage of the smartphone despite giving it a more professional and less social use than young people. Thus, it is possible to say that mobiles are called to be the Bicotian instrument that transforms everything and the nexus between the modern and the traditional context. In short, the main factor of virtual use will not be the technological competence associated with the generation that was born and grew with the internet, but the characteristic motivations of each generation that for years have remained constant as part of the evolutionary life process, especially for research, for socialization and entertainment in young people and in more professional and intimate use in adults. Young people continue to consume television, but increasingly advocate and on demand and dedicated to entertainment. Thus, Netflix is starting little by little thanks to a special young audience detected by movies and series. They are demanding, critical of technology and, above all, able of getting what they want by their own means, when and where they wish. In short, they are authentic pursuers. Therefore, researchers should continue to delve into the habits and new consumption practices that different users are acquiring. Finally, support and communication with which to educate Ecuadorians in the use of new technologies to ensure that all citizens are empowered by the tools that will set the pattern in the following decades and generations. This has been everything. If anyone has any question, you can contact us at the indicated email. Thank you very much for your presence and attention. Keep enjoying the conference and until next time. Thank you. Um, is Mark here? Can you come to your the next one so we can begin with you and install you? Do you have a PowerPoint? Yeah. For sure. Okay. Something like this, you can. Okay. Uh, it's it's here. here. Okay. So, thank you. My name is Mark Olier. I come from Barcelona, so here. Uh, and uh, I'm the, I teach in the uh, Polytechnical University of Catalonia. It's important for this paper to know that this paper has not been funded for by any project. Not because I don't get any funding ever, uh, but because this uh, paper arose when I was speaking with the director uh, of the school of my children. And uh, to know, well, uh, since you are uh, involved in ICT in education, 
we have a problem because a lot of parents ask us what they have to do about their children uh, dealing with uh, ICT at home because uh, they are concerned about it. So uh, after that conversation, we said, okay, maybe we, we can look into it, we have some ideas. But we said, since it's a, it's a question made us for the director of the school, and this has to go beyond our opinion that we can, this opinion that you can give in a bar. We said, let's, let's look at it. And so we started, we went to Google Scholar, we, kind of, we started entering queries, and we started reading. Those readings led to more readings, 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 readings. We started to put a lot of stuff on the ever note, and then we said, wait a minute, maybe we have a paper here. And then, and then we wrote it, and it, it was the first time in our, in our lives that uh, after 100 papers, it's the first paper that was accepted without any comment. It said, okay, you can publish this, so it's, it's, it's quite striking for us. See, it, 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 it never happened to me. So, uh, there's, a, there's a concern, I think, if somebody is, has, has children or nephews or something like that, uh, there's a concern about uh, there's something going on about ICT. Uh, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, I was one of the guys speaking about uh, ICT for innovation of education, let's break education, build it again, make, make it better. Okay, Steve Jobs in Africa with uh, Max and Seymour Papa with Globe. Okay, that's, but right now, technology is changing because there's a new development in, in uh, in technology. Something that uh, there's a lady that has published one book uh, this, this year, this very year, it's in February, it came out. It's called uh, Surveillance Capitalism. It's uh, <coughs> uh, a lady, uh, an emeritus professor from Harvard called Susanna Zwoff. And she has the, the thesis that right now we are seeing a new kind of capitalism. That what uh, it's extracting surplus about being the ability that those who gather a lot of data, half of changing the behavior of people. There's a loop where companies like Google, like Facebook, like Apple, like Microsoft, like, Apple, like Amazon, like Tencent, Tencent, and other companies, Alibaba, they get a lot of information about this, their uh, users, and they use this information that they have to predict changes of behavior, and then they introduce these, cha these, these uh, changes in the technology, forcing a change of behavior. Then they get more data, they get more accurate. And now we have a big problem. One of the examples of this is, for example, the, the problem of the Earth flat. Now there's a lot of people in the world who believe that the Earth is flat. And it's something that I thought that it was behind us, but right now you can see the documentary in Netflix, it's, it's there. Why? Because there's an algorithm in YouTube that it's optimized to, to make to keep the people inside the platform. You have to view more videos. And somehow the algorithm determined with this magical uh, neural network said, okay, if we get, uh, give to the viewers more outrageous videos, they will be outraged and they will stay in the platform. And now we have problems with people that don't vaccine their kids, and now we have uh, measles and other uh, uh, illnesses that they are coming back because people don't uh, vaccine their kids, or we have people who think that the Earth is flat, and something that we have checked that is not flat because we have satellites and shit like this. So we have a problem. So this capitalism is something new, it's arising, it's in the hands of a few companies, and it's in the design of technologies, how we design new technologies. For a new technology to be successful, it has these addictive methods, and it's affecting us, and it's affecting our kids. So, I, I grew up in the in the 70s, you know, I lived from 71, so uh, I was, I had all the access to TV that I wanted. All the access, but I only had like one hour of cartoons a day with luck. But there was a... Um, there was a coup in Spain in 82, and then we had three days straight of cartoons in the TV. Because you couldn't watch any news, so it was very, very nice for me, but that was it. Always just, but now we have a lot. Now we have changed from 
contents broadcasted and just TV in black and white, and now we have interactive com uh, contents, tablets, video games, um, and we, we are getting these since they, since they are toddlers, and I, I know because I'm exposed to my toddlers to, to, to technology, because what could go wrong? Then you realize that it's something they have to do about. Have to do something about this. And now, uh, we are seeing that the pattern, we, we started to, we come from the background of computer science, but we have to, to read papers of psychology and sociology and other fields that is, are not the ours. It's there, we cite it in the, in the paper, and it's uh, explained a lot of things about it. But in a nutshell, we're seeing that it, there's an increase about the time and the kind of engagement that kids are having worldwide. Worldwide. We see that on average in England now children have 15 hours of access to a screen, and this is the mean. This is the mean. It's more than two hours and a half for every kid. It's a lot of time. If you consider during the week a child that is eight hours at school, he has to sleep eight hours, and they go to Taekwondo or ballet or something like that. All the time that they are at home. They are connected, and, and, this is a, and this is a problem. Uh, we, have, we know that we have two kinds of things. We have cell phones, we have computers, online media, now they are connected. And I was, this issue arose also when I was, I was explaining this to somebody in the conference, in the coffee break. So we are adopting. I don't know if you remember in the 90s, if you were in the, in the internet in the 90s, there was this inspirational PowerPoints, you remember them? With nice picture of icebergs and clear skies and the rainforest and the uh, beautiful inspirational things. And, and it came, came around. Some, and some, some were dirty, a lot of PowerPoints with dirty jobs, but there was this stream of PowerPoints that came through the email. And I, I received them in the 90s and I sent them in the 90s to my shame. But then this, suddenly, we stopped my circle, we stopped doing that because it was, was a fad, it was not going nowhere. Okay, we have seen every, every power bunch in Comic Sans, no, don't do that again. And then, in 2004, 2005, they came again. They came again. Some friends that was, weren't on the internet in the 90s, they were, but we stopped because we had adapted. And now I still receive sometimes for my mother or my aunt, they send you one of these people. I think that my mother has stopped already, so it's, it's an improvement. This week, there's new technology, we do stupid things with it, we adopt it, it causes some kind of disruption. We see that some things we like and some we, things we don't, and we say, okay, these point, our PowerPoints are a stupid thing, now we stop and we adapt. And we are okay with the technology and then this is still made. But what happens right now is that we are in an exponential curve and everybody that comes to my city, you know, everybody knows about Lugo, more so, it, we go into the singularity according to Ryan Kurzweil and the, and the cult of the singularity in Silicon Valley, okay, but, but, but we are seeing this kind of improvements, so technology is advancing exponentially. I think that it was, uh, I read a, a while ago, this is not in the paper, so it's a bonus, uh, that in 1919, 100 years ago, there were two main great inventions. And I think one of those was the toaster. Great inventions, one of those was the toaster. Right now, we have this rate of invention every six hours. Today, we have the same rate of new invention, transformative inventions like the toaster. I use the toaster every day. So it's important every six hours. It is accelerating, it's not just that. So what happens right now is that we are breaking the cycle of adoption. We as a people we will not be able to adapt faster. We have our pace. We are humans, we are in society, and right now the adoption is so fast. For instance, when just we have realized that there's something called Instagram and something called Snapchat, then come, then now comes TikTok, and I don't know what the fuck it is. But it's there, and teenagers use it. I don't know what it is, I have to learn it, I'm freaking out. Because my toddlers are, I, I'm going to be 
from teenagers that they're going to be there. And I have to learn about it. So there's, there's some problem. Huh? So I talked about this. I said, but what could go wrong when we introduce these technologies? We have problems that kill what all of this usage of technology. Children are even losing time of sleep. We know that one of the worst things that we can do as a child or as a, an adult person is losing sleep. There's research, there's research validated consistently. We know that this research that only 25% of the studies are validated, but these studies have been consistently validated. If you want uh, to take a pill that will uh, reduce your, uh, your chances of getting cancer, getting diabetes, getting fat, getting stressed, heart attacks, and Alzheimer's, there's a pill and it's free. It's just sleep eight hours every day. There's correlations straight. If you start to lose sleep, then you will get, you will get more chances to get these illnesses. We know that. I recommend you the a book uh, by Matthew, Matthew Walker called Why We Sleep. Yeah, everybody should read it, but if children are losing sleep, it's really bad for their development because they will not get, and they are doing that. I lost a lot of sleep because I was reading books, but well, come on, what's bad with reading books? We have cyberbullying. Cyberbullying is one problem. Now it's not so common that children hit each other. When, when I was a child, bullying was something that you did with stones, but now, and, and fists and things like that, but now it's cyberbullying. It's, it's, Worse, but because when you are at home, you're not safe. If you, somebody wanted to get you, you could, you could run, you could hide, and then you get home and you're safe. You get with your pals, and now you're safe because you are a bunch of kids, and then you can have a proper fight. But if somebody wants to get you online, you're not safe. You're not nowhere. So it's a problem. And now we have these problems with self-image when kids are exposed to Snapchat, Instagram. And we not there's not enough. We, for me, it's that the, the the cover of the of men's health virus, and you see these 50 years old guys, you know, don't look that bad. It's a problem for me, but it's not so bad. But when you're a teenager, it's really bad. Then you get bulimia, and then you get these things. And it's happening all the time. Oh, no, no, no. So, the lady was talking in that. Okay, it was way longer than me, and less interesting than me. So, how can we cope with this? How can we cope with it? Well, it's active medi mediation. Parents and this have been watching studies with these science guys. So we are going to be with the we are going to be with the kids. The kids are using the technology, you are there. So you have to know what's going on. That is co used you with you use technology with kids. Then there's restriction. You put restriction, you don't, uh, you monitor, you put uh, spyware, you put parental blogging that we know that fails completely. Uh, and these, are, and these are the strategies, there are no more strategies. And what happens is that the studies prove that there are two strategies. One is restriction and monitoring, the other one is co-use and coaching the, child, the kids to use these technologies. And if you, the first rule is if you, what well, is the second one? <laughs> the second one. If you restrict and you monitor, you can help to avoid risk. But when shit happens, the kid is unprotected. But if you make this discussion, you let the kids play the technology, they, they, you let them to expose to risk and use the thing, and you help them and you help them to cope with it, then they are more and more likely to get into trouble. But also when you play the part, you are more likely to get into trouble, but you will get you will develop these tools, they will be able to adapt as we learn to not set these PowerPoints. So, we uh, have these recommendations, one is choose the quality of choose, choose the contents that you would give to your kids, balance digital and non-digital activities if you're a parent, try to take advantage of media content, so it's, it's like with food, it's, it's not about saying don't eat this, those sweets, it's drink, eat this also because it's nutritious and maybe you will like it and you will grow to like it. Uh, TV and video games are not digital nannies. This is important and I'm a parent and I'm guilty sometimes of that because I have to make supper, I have to make a Skype call and then say, okay, I have the tablet and let me 
work and do something useful with my life, not only being a parent. It's something that happens to all of us. We are guilty, so but we have to remember this sometimes. Teach by example. If you are in the dinner table with a smartphone, looking at the smartphone, how are you going to teach? Explain what's happened, uh, explain the implications of something online, that people are going to be able to find you what you do in the future. You have to know. And keep places in your house free of technology. Don't let children play with technology in, the, in their bedrooms, closed. Do it in the main room, in the living room. Uh, and talk about children, make uh, guidelines, explain, and then you will have the security hold. It's the huge security hold that it's called grandparents, and it's no way to avoid it. It's grandparents is not, it's a problem. And then you have to do analogic stuff with children, because if you only have, can play PlayStation with your children, it's, it's the only thing that they're going to learn to do. You have to take it to the mountain to do other stuff. It's the one of the things that we have found out is that the main predictor of how the children are going to cope with technology is the digital literacy of the parents. So first of all, we don't have to do anything with children. We don't have to send people from the faculty of uh, informatics in your school and teach children. You have to send to go and teach parents. Don't teach children to, to use technology. Teach the parents what are they doing. It's, it's the only way. Children will learn by themselves. But parents have to do these things and have to have their digital competencies straight. And they don't have it usually. And there's, uh, and, and there's, uh, and here we have also a problem of economic and cultural divide. Because if your parents are in the, in the upper uh, earning part of the society and they are educated, it's more likely that the kids are going to cope well with these technologies. And when you have these parents who are in the lower part of the society and the parents don't know how to use the technologies, they are going to have more technology and more unsupervised. So there is a problem here that is going to propagate in the future. So more research is needed, so I hope somebody wants to find me. I am fine. And that's it. So, um, thank you all for being here, and thank you, Mark, because actually that was uh, quite an interesting preview because I'm also going to continue with risks. In this case, not for kids, but uh, in general, and how to address risks from another perspective, which would be fictitious uh, contents. In this case, um, the presentation is, uh, as Carlos already said, it's, uh, it was conducted by me and by Laura Rodriguez Contreras from the University of Salamanca. And it is, yeah, the risks of uh, new technologies uh, in a TV series, in this case, Black Mirror. Um, why that? Well, as you have mentioned, uh, new technologies are a key element in our societies. I mentioned they are mobile phones, internet, or artificial intelligence, but, I mean, you name it, it's almost everything. I see a lot of devices from here and uh, so many more. So, uh, new technologies are all around us. And, um, they're great to many aspects, but they also bring some risks with them. Ethical, security, health risks, but um, they could be uh, much more. Um, what we want to address here is this uh, representation of risks, um, analyzing fictional contents. Uh, it's a way to uh, study defects on societies, but not directly, but from a, um, a fictitious uh, perspective. Um, I have there a quotation from uh, Slavoj Cizek, uh, which is that fiction is the best way to observe the world uh, we live in, because examining it directly could be unconceivable and traumatic. I don't know to what extent that uh, is true, but uh, 
it's clear that uh, in the field of communication studies, um, approaching uh, society from the its representation on um, fictional contents is, is a very relevant aspect. Um, why Black Mirror? Well, because it's a modern version of this to piece like 1984, Brave New World, Fahrenheit uh, 451, but also, I don't know, more modern ones like The Matrix or Minority Report. It's also one of the most relevant and successful series of the present, so therefore that's also uh, very interesting uh, because it reaches a, a, a huge amount of people. And the um, uh, internet is not working, so I can't really show the example, but uh, it has become a common reference to explain in real life events. Um, the most clear one probably is China's uh, rating system. Uh, it's always associated with this uh, chapter from the third season of Black Mirror called No Style, uh, because it's pretty similar, which is also quite scary, right? So, um, and also because of all that, Black Mirror has become the object of, uh, of a study of several scholar works that are, we are using as a basis. Uh, so what we want to do here is actually analyzing the depiction of, of reality made by, by this series, by, by Black Mirror, uh, paying special attention to its view of technology and uh, its effects on risk over contemporary Western societies. This is only applicable to Western societies because actually um, it's a very Western centristic series like almost everything we consume here. So some more specific uh, objectives would be to discover what are the technologies most frequently depicted in Black Mirror, to determine to what extent uh, they relate to current or feasible in the short term technologies, and also to discern, discern what are the risks, benefits, effects and behaviors associated with these technologies, so what surrounds them. Uh, these um, objectives can uh, be uh, resumed in these uh, two main research questions, so what technologies are most present and to what extent they are relatable with uh, current technologies, and also what are the most relevant uh, effects and risks associated with uh, these new technologies, and also how these technologies affect uh, the society, fictitious societies. Uh, what we did was uh, we conducted, conducted a content analysis of the 22 sorry, chapters of the TV series. Uh, there are five seasons from 2000. 11 to until 2019, it was in summer when it was released, the last one. And um, since the third season, they are uh, produced by Netflix. We are excluding Bandersnatch here, which is a, an interactive uh, movie that was developed. Um, it has, as interactive movie, it has different endings, so therefore we didn't include it in the LRS because it could pervert it. Uh, what we did was designing a codebook ad hoc for this study, and it had two parts. First, a social demographic. Um, we wanted to discover the, the, feature, the features of the main and secondary characters that would be more exploratory. And then what would really answer our research, research questions would be the depiction of technologies and risks associated with them. Uh, there were two coders, and our group and results were over uh, 0.6, which is uh, the minimum for exploratory studies, according to Neuendorf. Um, if you want to see the specific data, they are not here, but we have it uh, also in the proceedings, so it's open for everybody. What we discover, um, I'm talking now about the uh, preliminary results of the, of the characters. Uh, we found 78 characters that were considered relevant for the study. They were not extra or very secondary characters, but relevant for the um, story. Uh, men and women were equally represented. Uh, we discovered that it was mainly young adults, um, uh, the main or the ones uh, with the most relevant roles. So actually, yeah, uh, almost 27% uh, were between uh, 21 and 30 years. Almost uh, 44 were in the 30s, and more than 14 were between 41 and 50. And we also realized that 41% were middle and uh, almost 30% were upper middle socioeconomic status. status. Uh, this is quite interesting because uh, this is um, quite similar to the characteristics of the uh, target audience of this series or of Netflix in general. So this um, correlation with, with, the, uh, with the target audience is particularly interesting because it increases the warning or the critical um, uh, power of the, of the series. 
Uh, we also use this division of Umberto Eco, this division between integrated and apocalyptic uh, characters. We discovered that the majority, so 42.3% of characters, were integrated with the technological paradigm of the chapter. Uh, in fact, we realized that the ones that were integrated, so more in connection or, or more interacting with the um, technological uh, advances that were presented in the chapters, were the ones that were suffering the the risks or the effects more um, strongly. Uh, answering already uh, our first research question, we really saw that smartphones or tablets were present in half of the chapters and they were central to the story in five of them. Computers were present in ten of the chapters. Uh, they were never central uh, and actually they were marginal in six of the chapters, which uh, shows us how computers are something that we already take for granted. Uh, they are always there, but they are not so relevant anymore. Uh, social media was also quite relevant. They were present in nine chapters with a central goal in five of them. <coughs> Sorry. Um, quite interesting is the technological implants in humans, so biohacking, um, having microchip in your brain or somewhere in your body, um, which were present in nine chapters. And they had a dominant role in eight of them, so that was quite uh, interesting. Uh, these technologies were uh, a third of them. Uh, I mean, there were we found 90 representations of technologies. In the end, technologies we were we had around 10, but uh, they were they were represented uh, in different chapters. So in total, there were 90. Almost a third of them were very similar. And only 16 of the of those depictions were uh, totally unrealistic at the moment. Mm. We saw that smartphone, tablets, television, and social media were significantly overrepresented in their current form, so quite realistically. But technological implants in humans were uh, significantly overrepresented uh, as unrealistic technologies. Anyway, in general, uh, we saw that um, uh, the, the technologies depicted in the fictitious world were quite similar to or quite relatable to current technologies. And the risk, and probably this is the most interesting part, we saw that the lack of privacy is the most uh, frequent risk. Uh, it was present in more than a third of the representations of technologies. The lack of distinction between reality and virtual world was also quite uh, relevant. 22 of the chapters, addictive behavior, violent behaviors developed after those technologies, access to false, manipulated, or incomplete information. Uh, well, this last one, quite in relation with uh, fake news, something that we don't hear quite uh, constantly, so uh, those were the most relevant risks. And uh, finally, the general depiction of technology was rather negative. Uh, um, there were some that were a bit better, some a bit worse, but in general, the depiction was quite negative. And also it was interesting, the more predominant the technology it was, the more negative it was also depicted. So it shows that um, the technologies were um, or the main technologies were uh, depicted uh, negatively, so they would have a stronger warning or critical uh, effect. Uh, finally, uh, we can make a little uh, resume. Uh, smartphones and tablets, social media and technological implants are the most present technologies in this series. Uh, the different forms of biohacking uh, depicted in the series are usually realistic and with very negative effects. Probably they are the most, uh, let's say, dangerous. Um, um, innovation according to this series. The rest of the technologies are more realistic, but uh, in general they are also depicted uh, quite negatively. And the lack of privacy, security, uh, and also the lack of distinction between the real and the virtual world are the most uh, commonly present risks. Some limitations of the study, and, and finishing now, um, some technologies might indirectly relate to others, for example in this chapter, the entire history of you, we consider it uh, biohacking because it's actually a person who has a microchip connected to his eyes, but it's another uh, representation or interest representation of uh, social media. So actually, we just analyzed the most direct one. Uh, there are aspects outside of technology that were not studied, although um, Black Mirror also reflects a lot on social justice or journalism politics. Uh, they were not part of the study, we just focused on technology. And it is very important to highlight that Black Mirror is just one series and it is especially focused on the risks of technology. So obviously they are overrepresented here because that's actually the key of the series. Uh, there's no generalization possible. 
So if you if we wanted to see some more quantitative and, and, and generalization um, of technologies in this series, we would need, of course, a much bigger um, analysis with a much bigger sample. But uh, that was Black Mirror, so it's a bit more of a negative one. Yeah. So thanks a lot. That was all my session. Thank you, David. Uh, we continue with uh, Maximiliano Frias and Francisco Cevanes. The presentation Hate the Speech in Spain Against Aquarius Refugees. Spain. We uh, 
we audited the leads uh, almost like 2,000 messages because they are in other languages that is not Spanish. And finally, we have uh, 24,000 uh, messages. Two independent, two, two colors analyze this to this sample, and we obtain a uh, 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 reliability. Uh, we were passed the reliability. Reliability. Uh, sorry. Reliability. Reliability test of uh, five percent of the of the sample. Uh, we actually run automate sentiment analysis. This is to detect uh, negative and positive words uh, of every tweet. And finally, topic modeling to uh, obtain the main topic of, of the text. Uh, what, what we find? Uh, actually, we found that almost the 56% of the sample was positive and 27% of the sample was negative. But in these uh, negative uh, messages, we made two, two groups. Uh, uh, hate speech against uh, refugees and hate speech against uh, politicians. Why this? Because when we are uh, making the, the analysis of, the mess of these messages, we found that some people support the decision but hate or, or what talk about or talk bad about the other politician that doesn't support this decision. Uh, and the, well, um, actually the people who doesn't support anything of this. And what we found is uh, against refugees, we, f we have a total of 10% of the sample was negative, only to, to refugees, and we found that it doesn't exist a correlation between uh, the positive words and hate speech against refugees. Um, then uh, we found a significant portion of the of rejection against political uh, sorry uh, against politicians. We found uh, that a greatest a greatest number of positive words doesn't influence the level of hate speech, and a greatest negative words induce more hate speech against uh, politicians. Uh, well, about uh, the announce of the of the. Of the bubbles. When the Spanish president announced that uh, Spain going to uh, uh, welcome this boat, uh, the before it announced it was uh, more negative uh, reaction than before than after the announce. And in the case of positive words, there was uh, at the when they made the announce if the positive uh, reaction were, uh, was not uh, more because well, finally the, the people support this decision. Uh, in conclusion, uh, uh, we uh, only found that 27 of the sample contained hate speech and the most affected group was a politician with a 17% um, about request question 2 and request question 3, we found that uh, effectively the number of negative words influence the increase of hate speech against both groups. And, uh, but what well, in the opposite uh, uh, way, uh, the positive words do not influence uh, the, if they has more or less hate speech against refugees. And finally, uh, at the ar arrival of the T ship, uh, increase the number of positive messages. Thank you. Well, thank you, Max. Uh, now we'll continue with uh, Javier Amores. He's going to present uh, his presentation is deconstructing the symbolic visual frames of refugees and migrants in the main Western European media.
everyone. Good evening. How are you? Uh, I'm Javier Amores from the University of Salamanca. Uh, I carried out this, uh, this work, this research study, together with Carlos Ocila, present here. Um, this work is entitled like this, uh, Deconstructing the Connotative Visual Frames of Refugees and Migrants in the Main uh, Western European Media. As an introduction, as we already know, uh, we have been talking about now, uh, Europe is experiencing the worst migration crisis in its recent history. Uh, the number of forcibly displaced people today is uh, greater, it's larger, it's larger, it's higher than during World War II. Of the an increase of 55% uh, in just in only four years. So we can see here the evolution, the worsening, and the increase uh, of the number of asylum applications per year in the last, in the last years. As a justification, uh, we know that the way in which media represents displaced people could affect, could influence the attitudes of Europeans towards these groups. On the other hand, we already know we, um, also that there are many academic works uh, centered in the figuring this out of the migrant, of the migrant, of the immigrant, but really few studies focus on refugees in a specific. On the other hand, in addition, most of the studies are based on, on the textual component, but really few studies uh, are focused on the visual component, on the image. So we think that work, a study focusing the visual uh, representation of the migration in, in European media is pertinent and it's of great interest, actually. Uh, regarding the theoretical framework, the, uh, regarding the, the framing theory, we know that media usually uh, frame the reality, emphasizing uh, certain sort of elements or attributes in the text or, or the image or the photograph, um, influence in this way a particular way of thinking. Regarding the visual framing, uh, especially, we already know also that the image, the photograph, serves to frame more effectively than the test due to its uh, expressive, iconic, and symbolic power. And due to also, in addition, the image, uh, because it's the, the image is easier to interpret and test for the public, and more accessible and more pleasant for the audience. So, the image uh, could, ha could have a, great, a greater power than test to generate uh, memories and to influence, uh, uh, maybe to influence to affect the attitudes of the, of the sentiments, to, uh, to have uh, cognitive effects. Uh, in, this, uh, in this sense, we have a four level uh, system to analyze visual framing uh, proposed, proposed by Rory and uh, Dimitrova. According to, to, this, uh, to this system to analyze visual framing, we have a denotative level, a, a stylistic level, a connotative level, and an ideological level. In this work, we focus mainly on the connotative level, but uh, the denotative level is used. Uh, as well, to know how this, this connotative uh, frame is built, is constructed uh, by the denotative elements or attributes that, that, if, uh, that are uh, emphasizing and are selecting in the, in the photograph. So, mm, regarding the, um, the representation in, the, in past literature of migration and, and refuge, Western media usually depict migrants in a negative way, but when the subject in a specifically is uh, a refugee, this coverage today 
uh, nowadays seems to diverge. Uh, we don't really know. According to the drama and humanists, the European media transmit a vision of solidarity, uh, a positive vision in favor of the refugees. However, in the Austrian media, the frame that seems to, to stand out or to be highlighted is that which represents uh, them, the refugees, as a threat and as a burden, possible burden to, to receiving societies. Uh, regarding the attitudes of Westerners, we know, we also know that uh, the attitudes of Europeans and Westerners uh, to our uh, refuge and migration are mostly negative, um, are related, are, are related this, the, uh, these attitudes usually are related with uh, notions, with uh, perceptions of re uh, refuge and migration, uh, of uh, burden and threat, either realistic or the realistic, realistic or symbolic. Uh, regarding a uh, study, a uh, work um, carried out by Spike Sakin, Muller, and Hegarner, uh, this perception could depend, uh, could, uh, could depend on the characteristics, on the attributes of the migrant, of the refuge it's, uh, itself. Uh, I mean, the, the attributes, the, the characteristics of the environment, which may be variables was, uh, like age, the age, the gender of the religion of the, the migrant, could affect on the perception of the Europeans on the uh, acceptance degree, uh, degree of, of the preceding societies. On the other hand, we have we 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 gonna try. We have tried to identify to analyze four uh, frames in specific, four quantitative frames that we have identified in the academia in the past literature. The more the most negative frames, two most negative frames are those we, that, as we have uh, talked about the bottom frame and the third frame. We have an example here, and the two more positive frames. Uh, could be this uh, uh, the victimization frame and the normalization frame. We have the uh, examples here. What are the hypotheses? Uh, the main hypothesis is that these connotative frames, connotative visual frames, um, could that the uh, media transmit and disseminate. By the, uh, by the the photographs in the media, the, the professionals differ with respect in relation to the, the, notative, the notative elements that stand out that highlight in the photographs. So, uh, regarding the the number of refugees portrayed, uh, depicted, regarding the gender, regarding the age, the origin of the refugees, the whether or not security force appear are some in the, in the photograph regarding whether or not religious symbols or elements appear in the, in the picture. The method. Uh, so the method, we have carried out a content analysis of 500 uh, pictures um, by, um, by Google News. These pictures was aware. Uh, in these pictures, some uh, the re represented, depicted migrants or refugees. Um, they were collected from 2013 to 2017. And they have uh, they were collected by from uh, five countries and ten media. Uh, from Spain, Germany, France, and uh, France and uh, Italy, and United Kingdom. So, what did we find? Uh, first of all, as we always said, 
They're going to take the frames, they're going to, they're going to take the beautiful frames of refugee migrants of European media, disseminate, disseminate by this media in Europe, differ with respect of these variables, uh, the first of, on the first of these variables, where was the number of refugees, and as we can see here, when the picture, when the, when the photograph show many actors, many refugees, or large, large groups, or, or refugees, or migrants, this picture uh, frequently uh, represents the, the migration from the refuge as a threat or burden, and the opposite. So maybe we can we can uh, we can perceive them as a object, objectifying them. They represent them, objectifying them. And we can see here the, the picture. Uh, regarding the gender, as well, we can we can see in the test in the T test that when the picture uh, represent all the big female refugees or female migrants, the, the frame that stand out in the, that predominate in the picture is the threat, threat uh, the victimization frame and the opposite. When the, when the picture saw the, the picture um, the big male frame, male refugees, the, the frame that stand out, that predominate is the threat frame or burden frame. It's the same with the age. When we, when we see in the picture children, uh, it's, usually, it's usually represented, the, the refugee and migrants is usually represented as a, in a normalization, a normalization way and optimization way, and the opposite, when, when we see young or adults, uh, the frame that predominates is part of our Regarding the origin, the perceived origin in these pictures, in these photographs, when the, the photograph of Sao, the photograph that picked the refugees from Arab, Arab countries, the picture uh, in the picture predominate, uh, usually predominate more frequently a thread frame, a border frame. And when the picture in the, in the picture appear security force forces is the same. Uh, the picture normal usually represent them as a burden and as a threat, and the opposite when we don't see security forces, the, the frame is uh, usually a the normalization frame. And the same with religious elements, the, the last variable. Uh, we have found uh, statistical, statistical um, differences just for the third frame in this case. Uh, when we see religious, sim uh, religious symbols or religious elements in the picture, in the photograph, in the frame that stands out, that uh, predominates in the picture, is the third frame. We, can, we usually perceive the refuge and the migration as a threat, as a possible threat for our societies. As a conclusion, in summary, when the picture, when the media represent migration and refuge, we have in, the, in their image with large, large groups of refugees or displaced people, with security forces, with male actors, with adult actors, um, we can see religious elements and religious symbols. The frame that predominates usually is burden or threat frame. And in the opposite, when pictures uh, spread, disseminated by the European media, uh, represent or depict few refugees or no security forces, female refugees, refugees, uh, children refugees, uh, refugees from the Middle East and the Arab region, Arab region and no religious elements, the frame that seems to stand out is the normalization or victimization frame, the uh, most positive frame, more positive frame. Uh, as a conclusion, oh, as we can see, there are differences in the connotative frames transmitted by photographs 
in European Union in relation to the, the notative elements that are represented in the image. Just as the attitudes of Europeans towards migration, this representation differ with respect of the respect to the characteristics, to the attributes of the refugee in himself. And these friends, we know these friends could have influenced and reinforced previous attitudes about the different types of displaced people. And this knowledge, uh, this knowledge could, uh, could help us to, to provide uh, recommendations and advices for media professionals and policy makers. Uh, that's all. Yeah, thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Javier.